Ms. Brown, can you call me please? In the middle of the night, she cozy on the bed. Bossing kiss on top of she husband head. Two minutes to go. Two One minute to go. Nancy is the king of our imagination, bringing stories with the light of the ancient Africa. Breda Nancy is a griot, a chantuel, a calypsonian. What a wonderful delight is to hear her stories. Like a normal spider web, she weaves her stories, and the grandpa and the kids, they all love what there's to hear. Red and Nancy is the king of our imagination, and Nancy is the wonder of creation.
Great Anansi is the king of our imagination. Anansi is the wonder of creation. Thank you very much for joining us for this very special edition of Talking on Purpose. What makes it special? The Edna Manley College of the Visual and Performing Arts has for a number of years been hosting one leg of the Anansi Sound Splash Storytelling Festival and Conference, and that leg is called Anansi Goes to College. So the storytellers have been to colleges around the country having workshops. And in the past, we have gone to all the colleges on the same day. And that day has been on the Thursday of the festival. Well, guess what? This Thursday is November 19th. It's International Men's Day. And a festival with a Nancy could not rightfully ignore that day. So we want to explore what it is about our folklore, our storytelling that can inform us about who our men are. But we're not calling it an ancient men, you know. We're calling it understanding gender in Caribbean folklore. And to help walk us through this is Nicole Williams, who is principal lecturer and head of aesthetics at the St. Joseph's Teachers College, and Professor Opal Palmer Adisa, who is the university director of the Institute for Gender Studies at the University of the West Indies. I believe you have um, branches, cells on the other campuses. On the Mona campus, on the St. Augustine campus, and at the Barbados Cave Hill campus, yes. Wonderful. And my co-host is going to be Mr. Sean Thomas, who is a senior librarian of the Jamaica Library Service, where many of us went to hear stories and grew up on stories there on a Saturday morning. Very importantly, the library has been an important partner of the Anansi Sound Splash Storytelling Festival. And we recently signed with them an MOU to establish storytelling clubs, structured storytelling clubs in all the libraries across Jamaica. Now, them say it's going to be in the parish libraries to begin with. But I know that they have over 800 libraries because they have community libraries and mobile libraries. And me dream big like Anansi that one of these days, there shall be storytelling clubs <laughs> in all of these libraries. Let us go straight to our discussion. We say it is called understanding gender. 
And when I was little, all I did know was that Bulla was a noun, soft and tender, mute agenda. <laughs> I didn't know anything else about gender. But now gender is a topical issue. Professor Opal Palmer Adisa, what am I to understand when we say gender? I'm very glad that you've asked that because, you know, gender is so widely misunderstood. And gender is really just a term that embraces men, women, boys and girls. And what, when we talk about gender studies, we're looking at how is it that men and women, boys and girls, operate in the society? Um, what are the things that are socially structured, social constructs of what it is to be a man, what it is to be a woman, what it is to be a boy, what it is to be a girl? So for instance, I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, I was called a tomboy, which in these ter days would be a very malign term because it says that a girl who likes to run up and down and climb trees and jump in the water is, has can be a girl, she has to be a tomboy. So gender are looking at all of these social constructs of who we are or who we're said to be. And it's really saying that in many ways they are inaccurate. And what it is saying is that men and women, boys and girls are supposed to be allowed the full latitude to choose who or what they want to be that should not be defined by their sex. Okay, so you see now you really mean to confuse me because you're going to talk about sex which means something else, which as is, we have learned, but you also did not use male, female. So I want to know what make boy and girl, man and woman, different from male, female, and what sex have to do with that. Okay, so sex has to do with the biological features of what it is to be a man and what it is to be a girl. So the most common and pronounced things are women have vagina and men have penis. Okay, so that's so the biological, physical definition of what makes you a female and what makes you a girl. Women can have babies, men offer sperm for us to have babies. They cannot carry babies. So these sex refers to that biological difference between what it is a man and what it is a woman. Okay, so there we have our understanding of gender. I mean, also we could have spent the next three years because it, it's not simple. Not at all. And it's not complicated, but it's complex. It's complex. To to that. I want to go to Nicole Williams, who earlier told me that she's a proud graduate of the Edna Manley College of the Visual and Performing Arts. And that once upon a time, a long time ago, one of the things she had to study was storytelling. Nicole, how are we to understand folklore? When we say folklore, what exactly are we talking about? Well, the terminology folklore is an extensive one. Um, it is very fluid. One would say in, in its simplest term, it is anything that has to do with the folk. And by the folk, that German terminology folk, it is anything that has to do with the people and the masses. So folklore is anything that celebrates the masses. It is anything, whether it is verbal, scribal, or iconic, that celebrates the mass. Um, so a lot of people are understand folklore just to be our stories or proverbs or songs, but it's also in our iconic representations or drawings, um, what it is that we identify and associate a culture or a people with. Thank you very much. Iconic. So you mean if I go downtown and I were to look at that carving by Edna Manley, Negro Aroused, I could properly classify that as part of my folklore. It's one of our most popular pieces. Yes, it is part of the cultural representation. It is an iconic representation of the folk. So it is a part of our folklore. Okay. So, so for the purposes of not having um, a discussion that lasts for three centuries, mm -hmm. we're going to narrow our understanding down today to the stories. 
and perhaps some of the folk songs will come in since we know that all our stories have folk songs in them. And I want to go yeah. back to you now, Professor Opal Palmer Adisa. When you think of all the stories that you know, what is the immediate picture that comes to mind about men? And I'm focusing now on men because it is International Men's Day. Right. So unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, growing up in Jamaica and growing up with a Nancy stories, the first image that comes to mind is men as tricksters being able and particularly being able to outsmart others. So that's, for me, what is the first and most important thing about Anansi stories, was that Anansi had the ability to outsmart others to get his way. So, you know, there is subterfuge, of course, but there is also the ability with words and to use people's um, specific traits to turn it around for your advantage. So for me, that is definitely an image of manhood, Jamaican manhood that I think still is in my brainwave. And you would say that definition or that description of a particular kind of Jamaican man is what we call a sweet boy. Sweet bar original, yes. But I like how you pick pan and answer now for calling Ginal. So I'm going to go with the sweet boy. All right, go on and with the sweet boy. You see, see boy. you see the sweet boyness of the Jamaican men as part of their Nancy character? Well, you know, um, not necessarily, you know. I, when I think about a Nancy, I think of a Nancy more than what people normally want to. Describe him as I see a Nancy more of one that takes on a, a cerebral process of analyzing and critiquing a situation, and as Adisa says, to use it to his advantage. So I think of a Nancy as a genius, I think of a Nancy as being highly intelligent and not necessarily sweet boy. Um, but I want to weigh into on the way that we look at gender, um, in our stories because I want to see gender. Um, as a fluidity in terms of dominance and power between men and women in our stories. Mm -hmm. So I don't just see power being ascribed to the male figures, but also to the female figures mm -hmm. in the stories that we tell ourselves and our children. Some time ago, there was a, a very spirited debate that was started, interestingly enough, at a conference of teachers. And in that debate, it had been tabled that we should ban a Nancy, that we should have nothing to do with him in our classrooms, and our children should not be taught about a Nancy. I want to know if there is any way that either of you believe that the picture we have of a Nancy is part of the way our men are socialized in the way that socialization also happens in informal spaces. Yeah, let me, I, and I also want to piggyback to something Nicole said, and I really like the way in which she reframed and recalibrate a Nancy as this genius. I don't think I would go that far. But one of the things I will say, though, you know, a Nancy comes from Ghana. And one of the things that didn't travel with us, and when I was in Ghana, it was the first time I heard about a Nancy's wife. Okay, so a Nancy has a wife. I think it's Amina or whatever. Maybe uh, I, I could be the second you could wife, be right. but his but wife is Asso. Asso, right. So Anansi has a wife, and his wife, in fact, is a very informed and engaged and often guides Anansi. So I think because of our experience of enslavement and the fact that we needed to outwit our enslaver, the white oppressor, then a Nancy and that image of a Nancy has persisted. And I think it can be transformed and it should be transformed. So I, we can't just throw out a Nancy. That to me would be sacrilegious. It, it would not be something that we should want to do. What we should want to do is to upgrade a Nancy and to emphasize some of those characteristics that Nicole pointed to, which are evident in a Nancy and his behavior, because he is able to take on people's stories and turn it around for his benefit. And that is seen to be a very clever person in other 
context. You see? And so, yes, and so I, I, I want to split hairs a little bit, um, Nicole, about the choice of the word upgrade, because that sounds like we want to make Anansi over into something that he was not. What if yes. we use the word reclaim? What if that I, allowed us to understand that Anansi was a particular deity where he originated from, but through the colonial lenses, he became something else? And that is that is exactly where I would want to pitch that argument, and um, I mean, of not um, of updating Anansi. One of the things that um, is being voiced a lot now, as people delve into 21st century ways of thinking and methodologies, is this whole notion of learning and unlearning and relearning. And I think that's what a lot of Caribbean people, when we look at Anansi have to do we have to unlearn what they have fashioned him to be and as you see as you said see him as the eshu elegba because that's who he is mm -hmm. he's the god the deity of the crossroads and what he does is that he stands at the crossroads and allow people to make their decisions and nancy never cons anybody into a decision people choose what they want. And Nancy, put the argument. And Nancy, put and the argument. And, and that is the crux of the argument. I am the God of the crossroads, and you decide the world that you take. Now, if we're to look at Nancy in that way, then we understand the whole thing of scamming, that people say is Nancyism, the whole thing of um, stealing and that sort of thing, canarticism, is not Nancy. A canartist is one who deliberately take your thing and point in a direction. And Nancy, all he simply does is to open the ways and people make a decision. So, so I we want are to back up a little vision bit and teach. Sorry, a little yes. bit now about the way in which people speak things of us as real creatures that we come to believe, which might not be necessarily who we are. So we hear through the European lens, why Jamaican man, they, they, they wicked, they lazy, them, them is a gallus, them all of these things. And very often it is equated to a Nancy. And when we look at our men, Opal Palmer Adisa, I don't know of anywhere in the world where men work so hard. The men who sell clothes on the sidewalk, every night they move them store. And every morning they come and them set up back them store. And them is the minder of the store. Them is the customer assistant rep. Them is everything. And yet we hear that they are lazy in the way we hear these untruths. Can I go so far about a Nancy? Yes, I think we can. And it's true that what we have projected is one aspect of manhood. We have looked at the most negative, and that is part of the colonial legacy, because we, you know, we've looked at the most negative also in terms of womanhood, if you could might say that. So we've looked at the most negative, all of those uh, traits that you've pointed out, and that we have said this is what Jamaican men are. But there are many of us who know that there is also it's a continuum, and there are also these other men who have been steadfast, who have been fathers, who have been husbands, who have been loyal, who have always been there from the beginning, and what we're seeking. And what gender seeks is to create a balance and to provide a platform so that we can have all of these men and the men coming up with these very narrow stories don't feel like them have to be a gallus. They can understand that they don't, mm -hmm. you know, and they will still be appreciated and there's a place for them in the society. Um, and again, it's the historical lens, you know, we don't have that here. We tend to... Um, close off that part of Once our history. Once upon a time is a long, long time and exactly. has nothing to do with me. Well, I know a lady who make us know that Once Upon a Time is right now. Her name is Louise Bennett Coverley. <laughs> and we give thanks to Louise Bennett Coverley for the things that she has observed and documented. She said so herself, that she observed who we are and she documented. I wonder if we could take a break just to look at 
Louise Bennett's documentation of men, relationship to men, men and women, gender relationships in two of her poems. We're going to look at them one at a time. And the first poem I'd like to look at is um, by Louise Bennett, of course, called Dry Foot Boy. The performers are from the School of Drama of the Edna Manley College of the Visual and Performing Arts, and the first performer will be Kiana Jackson. Did I say that they're first year students? Yes, so let us welcome Kiana. What wrong with me, every drive boy? Damn, y'all got him the muck. And when we meet in Tara night, the boy give me a shock. Me tell him the same answer, and he goes, them send Odi. And ask him where I'm getting on. He say, Oh, jolly, jolly. Mr. feel sorry for the poor bad look his world. Me think him come foreign and come catch bad foreign cool. Me think him got a bad sweat tooth. What has him chat chat one? Me find out that his foreign poor and the boy was a put on. For him answer to nearly all me say. What? Actually? Oh, they? And all them sitting there. He hear joke and he hear them laugh. But he hear the boy. Ha ha. And he's sure you got that belly dash out of the skinny man. Same time he asked me to help on me holla. Why kill out? No chat to me when I had pity a time at your mouth. He stand up like him stunted. Then he hear him now. How silly, silly. I don't think I really understand you actually. Me say. You understand me, ya? Uh? No, you name come to a school. Always a visit Nana Kitchen and a kill off you gonna go soup. No, all I can say is actually. Boy, top! Warm to them sweet Jamaica joke I use for pop. Him get next and walk through the door. Him heading at the ear. Him get ball out all time. Going already? What? Oh dear. <laughs> and from that near till to the mark, the mark got in the mark. Miss Mary Drive Football can't get over the shock. A beautifully rendered version of Miss Lou's Dry Foot Boy. And now we're going to hear another Miss Lou poem, No Little Twang. And this time, the performer will be Keron Salmon, also a first-year student from the School of Drama here at the Edna Manley College of the Visual and Performing Arts. Me glad for see your combat boy. But lad, you let me down. My shame I so till all I'm a proud Miss Joppa Brown. You mean you go to America and spend six whole months there and come back not a piece better than all you did go away? Why, you know she missed me you come after you thanks so long. Not even little language. Why not even little swan? And your sister, what work on glue one week with America? She talks so nice now that we have the joints to understand. Why? You could improve yourself when you get so much pain. You spend six months of hurry and come back ugly same way. Not even a drip trousers or a pass the reading coat. Not even a gold teeth or a gold chain on your throat. Suppose me last my past and go introduce you to a stranger. As my lamented son what yet come from America, they would have laughed at them boy, me couldn't tell them so. They would have said me like, you was a spent time back on Moko. No back on to me boy, you talk too bad. Shut up them out. I don't know how you your papa going to make it out. If you want to please him, make him think you bring back something new. You always call him pop. This evening when he come, Yes, your, your, your comment on that story, poem, Dry Foot Boy, Nicole. 
But I mean, that goes, I mean, that's what I was saying in that there is a fluidity in the representation of men in um, our four pieces. Um, because we know we see men as strong, domineering figures in a lot of pieces. When you think about a big boy story, um, when you think about a black man, tiny man, coolie man story, then you see um, the powerful men. But you see now, um, it, it, it's more than an agenda issue. You see where the men are almost ridiculed in these two poems, uh, you know, in some sense, because, again, they want to be the idyllic representative of who um, this person that, 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 that has acquired something, as we say in Jamaica, quote unquote, is supposed to be. And this something that they're supposed to get is language. So it goes to the whole um, dialogue and language. It goes to the whole discussion on what language represents or represented at that time. And how it is that the masculine figure should be the representation of that dominant presence of acquiring knowledge to show that you are bigger than what the rest of the society is. Um, so I think it goes to not just the, the, the whole issue of gender, but the issue of gender and language um, for those two poems. Thank you very much, but, Nicole. I know that um, your students are waiting on you, and we're so happy that you were able to join us. I, I am not letting you go. I'm just letting you know that if and whenever you have to slip out, we will understand. Because okay. earlier, Professor Opal Palmer Adisa spoke about the dynamics of power. And if I were to borrow a word now that I hear big head people using, intersectionality. <laughs> All right, now. All right. <laughs> because you brought in the big boy and you brought in the issue of race. And in that Louise Bennett poem, Dry Foot Boy, is a woman who is making the comment about this man's inability to reach what it is that is expected of him. So I'd like you to, to discuss that for us, Opal. Well, it's, it's race and it's class. And in Jamaica, those are still very big issues. Um, it's interesting because she, they start off by trying to belittle him, dry foot boy. That is not a compliment at all. And whereas, as Nicole says, it's about language and acquisition of a certain language, the, the contrast between two the both poems are interesting because in this poem, dry foot boy, here is someone who has gone away and is speaking in a way that everybody pretends they cannot understand, but it is the language that the school system has and still insists that we speak, right? And so they're ridiculing him for that attitude. In the other story, if I might jump into the other By story. By Keron, Keron, Salmon did for us no little twang. No little twang. Uh, here is the reverse, right? So the scale is tipped on the other end. Someone has gone away for six months and then come back and then I talk just like all away. So oh, the poor man can't write. He can't, can't do nothing write. right. <laughs> so this is what both stories says, that on the one hand, if you come back and you try to pretend as if you've acquired those things, acquisition of language that you're supposed to, then you're showing off. The element of power, because in the Nolikul Twang, the mother warns him that even though I am so upset at the fact that you come back, so you better straighten up before your father, father. Exactly. come home. Exactly, exactly, exactly. And notice that in the first poem, it is the girls, the women, who are making fun of Miss Mary's dry foot boy. We don't hear anything about what the men have to say about it, right? So it's almost as if these women because they have no access, the only thing they can do is to point out his faults. But he, in some ways, is above them because he doesn't recapitulate at the end. He doesn't try to speak any differently. He continues in who he is. And so there are these two stories of the community ridiculing him, but him continuing in his own power.
That's that's another power dynamic, though, uh, Nicole, that we very often talk about in Jamaica and perhaps in the wider Caribbean and other places in the world, about Oman Tong, that men are physically violent and they express their power in this kind of way. And the women who are not that physically strong, when we go to tell them something, you know, we tell them. And certainly in both poems, we see the Oman tongue at work. I want, I want to also um, join in on that, Amina, because in the other aspects where the women display physical strength and it is not her tongue that is her power, then she is demonized. When you think about the Sukhanyan, um, that woman, when you think about the old eye, when you think about the cat woman, when you think about Annie Palmer, she's not saying anything. But then the exertion of these physical strengths, then these women, when you think about um, a lady in, 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 in um, our folklore called Long Titi Susan, that when, if a man tests her what she does with her breasts and the three and the, and the one foot nurse, when you find that these women have dominance in terms of physical power, you find that they are demonized. And then it goes back now to this whole thing of Lord woman love talking, so the woman power is in our talk, you know? But then we have other women who have physical strength and that in our literature, in our folklore, we sort of position them to be um, women who should be looked down on. They are how, wicked women. How can you know? we so that's, use... That's so Sorry, yes. Nicole. How can we use these stories, these images of men and women in the classroom, in Sunday school, to change the narrative about how we see men, about how we see women, and the relationships between the two? Well, I think, in fact, this is what has been happening. And this can provide a platform and a methodology for teachers because we're looking just at that. I just want to say a couple of things historically that during slavery, a lot of there's documentation of a lot of women being whipped for their tongue, right? Because it was what they used. It was the defense they used, and not against their mates, but against the master. So there's a lot, of, a number of historical documentation about slave women being whipped or being fined for tracing out, which Jamaica is so famous for, um, the overseer or the master, and they were punished for that. And of course, we also have images of strong women, nan nanny and others who are um, verified in the society. But you are in fact creating a platform for that discussion that these we need to own and respect our folklore and our folk stories. And they provide a rich milieu to discuss the gender roles for our boys and girls and our young adults to look at, oh yeah, this is all. Why is a dry foot boy? Why is it the women are laughing at him? You know, what does that mean? And so it, this is the way it happens. And, and I hear you both saying that there is no understanding gender in folklore without understanding the time. Because a story told in 1838 would have different implications from a story told or written in 2020. Understanding the time, understanding the social structure, understanding the political structure, mm -hmm. understanding the, the access to justice or the lack of the economic power. And that when we try to deconstruct gender in our folklore, we need to locate it. Can I use that nice word again in, in all of these intersectionalities. Absolutely. <laughs> Can I give each of you one minute just to take us into the future? Um, yes, I'm going to run out and thank you so much, Amina, for having me. Mm -hmm. um, the post-colonial writers always talk about writing back to the empire. Feminist theorists talk about um, revisioning the work one of the things that we don't see in the oral aspect of the tradition is that revisioning and retelling from the other point of view. And I think that is now what we have to take on as we look at the, the, the future, revisioning the stories from other points of view. So here is the Nancy's wife. She washed the pot. 
he did not share anything with her about the pot. She washed the pot and she got a flogging for washing the pot. The man beat her. Right? The whip. We the whip beat her. <laughs> the, the whip. The whip. Yes. So we have to tell the story. We have to tell the stories differently, right? We have to um, tell the stories from other points of views. Uh, and, and a lot of thing, time is that we, we think about, oh, I have to write it. Yes. That's the post-colonial thinking, that I have to write it. Yes. But we understand the power of the oral language. And I think that's what we have to start adapting. As and, we and, and, what, and what we left out in the discussion so far and don't have time to go into, but which you reminded me of when you raised that story, is the spiritual levels of the story. That there is a reason Anansi didn't tell her about the part. It wasn't her spiritual connection. It was his. And afar she go fast because she has her own spiritual connections, which very often is not shared even within the family in that structure of the cosmology from, from Africa and where Anansi is from. And so some other time we can discuss that just to accept what you said about understanding the various levels of the story so that when we tell it, we know how we can revision and reimagine how it can impact us. Thank you so very much, Nicole, principal lecturer and head of the Department of Aesthetics, Kuya. <laughs> Thanks, Opal. Yes, so um, piggybacking on what Nicole has said is about reframing. So there are a couple of things that I think is really important for us to say. As Jamaican people, the majority of whom are from Africa, we need to know our African history, the cosmology, the religion, which has been denigrated, which we have since also accepted as denigrated and made bad. So obia is bad. But obia, if people understood what it is to have your obia, your strength, you know that that is not bad. Everybody want their obia you know, to take you forward, to, do, to fight the enemies, um, to create a block when people are coming at you, and it's not just about witchcraft or whatever, it's, it's much more than that. And so because of uh, colonialism and Christianity, we have lost the reality and the nuances of our spiritual and religious upbringing that we brought here, and that is still evident in many aspects of Jamaica society. We do have to reframe the, the stories. We do have to preserve the oral tradition. And I'm so, I just want to say here publicly, I'm grateful to you. Give thanks. Really, truly. I am grateful to you for taking this on and preserving it and letting us see the aesthetic value of storytelling. Give thanks, and I, my and sister. And I truly honor you. So we have to retell the stories. We have to reclaim the, the oral tradition. Take the tablets from our children because none of the stories that they're watching has anything to do with them and it is further alienating them in a way that even my generation, a boom, baby boomer, wasn't alienated. And so we have to retell the stories and look at all of the gender implications. And the point you made about Anansi and his wife um, having a different spiritual um, guidance or guides is also important. And that we can coexist in a society in different religious and spiritual frameworks if we understand and respect each other. But we, as a Jamaicans, definitely need to return to our African ancestry and to use that to know that there is value in it. There are some parts of it, like in every culture, that we discard. But for the most part, our sense of medicine and local herbs, um, the wisdom in the folklores, it's evident there. And so it is to re reclaim it and to reframe it so that it is uh, functional and adaptable to the kind of society and development that we want to go towards. Wow, what a lot of work we have to do. The work only now start. Thank you very much. Thank Professor you. Opal Palmer Adisa, and we already said thanks to Nicole. And now it is your turn mm. to. Before we give them all a turn, if you would allow me, please, uh, Professor Opal Palmer Adisa, 
Nicole, Sean, everybody who is listening and watching, to acknowledge the many people around the world. I love to say that when we're doing this, around the world who are listening now to our discussion and watching. And I want to especially acknowledge Dr. Anthony Charles, who sends his greetings, his salutations to everyone and to contribute that in addition to what is being said, there is documentation on the sociological links between the genders, power structures, and speech. This, this, that's very important, how we language a particular kind of reality or, or unlanguage it when we learn to speak differently. This subconsciously integrates with the oral traditions. It shows in our history. The problem is lack of integration of thought and our repetition of our mistakes. We are repeat the mistakes. And then Sean, Please allow me now to acknowledge Dr. Marcia Burroughs, a lecturer in cultural studies at the newly established and perhaps most recent faculty of the University of the West Indies, the Faculty of Culture, Creative something, forgive me, Marcia, there's a C. And Culture, Creative and Performing Arts. Oh, wonderful. And we're so happy that you're able to join us you would have heard Nicole talk about a wider definition of how we understand the oral tradition, how we understand folklore. And she would have mentioned whatever it is that is iconic. And so I am just looking forward to your presentation on that iconic part of Bayesian culture and cultural heritage, which you call landship. So everybody let's welcome Dr. Marcia Burroughs. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Good afternoon, everyone. Good I'm afternoon. sailing in from Barbados. <laughs> land ships sail. There are ships on land that sail. And interesting, Kamal Brathwaite, who was my heart, my heart. Kamal talks about the body voice. Watching your um, speakers just now, Amina, we settled on the construct of voice and the importance of voice of the oral culture of continuing the stories and Camo has a quote he says you know this is the body voice so i didn't put that in there but i will say mapping meanings of the body voice sails and waters in the space of land ships because land ships dance they use their bodies to tell the story. And the first image I want to show you is this beautiful image by a very young man. It took me 20 years to figure out what he did here. I, I took 20 years to reach this point. This artist found it immediately. This is his version. He was only 24 year old, years old when he did this. This is his version of a land ship. Notice that the ship is made of souls. So these are spirits upon spirits upon spirits. Notice that the ship is dancing on the ship. So the individuals of the ship known as land ships companies are dancing on the ship. They're led by a sailing master or a dancing master. And this is a modern version. So you are also looking at International Men's Day. Traditionally, land ships were all men. I really mean men. 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 year olds or men. In the contemporary, especially in the 21st century, there has been a recruitment of girls. So now we have the girls as the nurses and notice the hats on the nursing hats, but the leader of the ship is still male. He did this and I was blown away because 20 years of reading documents in the British archives and talking and talking and talking to the elders. I had just reached that point that there are meanings to landship that are spiritual, but we in Barbados, we still have to unfold them. And he did this. Okay. This is an image. The lead, this guy, this guy, gentleman here, you will see dance is 79 years old. These young girls are literally probably 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. This boy is about, so they're very young. However, the most energetic person here is him. 
the 79 year old. He has been in many, many, many land ships over his lifetime. He was called the quartermaster. Land ships have an imagery shipping industry. So a quartermaster on a ship is someone who looks after the stores. But he also is the drill master. If you are in the regiment or the army, a drill master is a person who helps you to do the maneuvers. What we are about to see are land ship maneuvers. They're dancing outside of the house of their admiral. And I will show you an image of the admiral. Unfortunately, right now, the admiral has been very ill. And so they gathered, this image is from two days ago. They gathered to dance for the admiral who is very ill. I'll let you just enjoy the music. place they're in the city in a very poor working class community land ships come from the working class still in the 21st century the middle classes have mocked the land ship have said they're mocking the the colonizers that they're dressed in the royal navy uniform this is an image from 1973 this gentleman would be known as a sailing master the sailing master always walks in front of the ship then this is one of the admirals. Trust me, this is probably yellow feathers on his head. These ropes are of several colors and that rope will be of several colors, but the uniform must be white. So in the 1970s, the land ships were ridiculed because they were supposed to be trying to mimic the British. What I have argued is that they're cloaking their heritage because this gentleman, Captain Perch, again in his seventies at the time, um, and they're marching across, this is on independence. And that's the background there of the city. What we just saw dancing, there's been a gender shift as Amina was saying. This is the landship of the 1970s. I'm just showing you the landship of the 21st century. Gender shifts. The older gentleman is of the era of the 1970s that you see here. The younger children are the ch changes of the ships. So this is storytelling. So let me tell story. Amina, this is Winston Farrell's poem. Yeah. And so let me go. My share has gone right in front of this. Right. So he has a poem called Tribute. Let my children know how I have maneuvered a century or more of rough seas from the whole of my ship to the deck of my horse and buggy, from pond grass and plantation to a new language of drums, borrowed rhythms that now cash my own mortgage. And it's a lovely poem. If we had time, we would do the whole thing, but I wanna pull up something again. Amina and the professors were just talking. Farrell is saying that the land ships are a testimony of an African Caribbean spirit over the legacy of slavery. So he talks about how the cultural form of land ships provide the avenues for escape. He calls them a navy of land lovers. They, they, they really do say they're a navy. They're dressed like sailors and they sail on land. So the ship sails on land and they sail through paved highways. Literally, they go on the roads, they perform on the roads. In recent times, they perform for tourism. So, but what I just showed you is that they're performing for their admiral. So they're performing outside his home. So they're in the community. And the pride in my pocket and the pain in my penny whistle, the penny whistle is the, the sound you just heard. Now, origins of the land ship quickly, because we don't have much time. I believe that land ships are older than they think. But the oral history talks about they begin either in 1863 or 1868. Let me clarify this. We know that from enslavement, 
African Barbadians danced, they drummed, they did what you would call moko jumbi, what we call stilt walkers. They danced shaggy bear, what you would call pitchy patchy, we in Barbados call shaggy bear. We know they danced and they drummed, but somewhere around the late 19th century, this entity showed up and they called themselves shipping societies. Now, the interesting thing about the British, right, is that the British like to tax you. So they might have been shipping societies up and down all the plantations. Once the British found out about them, they said, right, you have to pay tax. You have to pay a fee for being a friendly society. We're going to register you and you pay such and such and such every year. On the other hand, for a researcher like me, it's wonderful because then suddenly I have documentation. So I can't speak to anyone from the 19th century, but I look in the documents and it's true. We now know that they danced in St. John and we now know that they were registered, two ships had to be registered in 1898. One was called the Ship Nelson and one was called the Victory Naval. These were shipping societies or friendly societies. What I've done, learned from my research is that if you form a ship, so it's a shipping community, you look for a British ship. Could it be German ship? Could it be French ship? Could it be anything? Well, it's happening in the British Empire. So that kind of makes sense. In St. Michael, which is in the town, like Kingston is Kingston downtown. St. Michael is a parish in the town and it seems we had the majority of the ships that were registered in the town. So for example, Bay Street is an area, if you know Barbados well, it has a, it's a lovely beach out there. It's a wonderful beach you walk. So, but we know now that there was a captain named Captain Branford in 1931, who was the captain of a ship. We also now know that there are other, sorry, I keep moving around. There, there are other names of ships. You know, there's the Cornwall and the Iron Duke and the Queen Mary and the War Spike that they're picking up names of very popular British shipping, ships that are coming to Barbados and then creating themselves, calling themselves that land ship. We also know, for example, whoops. We also know, for example, that in the 1930s, this is the height of shipping culture. You had at least 3,000 ships, 60 ships and 3,000 crews, sorry. And so there's a Lord High Admiral Walcott who was seen in the 1930s and he was absolutely covered in feathers. It kind of looks like a Marcus Garvey helmet he's wearing with lots of feathers. Empire Club is a cricket club of the black for the black people or the working class Empire Club, thousands of spectators. And at the time, this is a gendered ship, really one or two women, not, but not many. And you would have these boys who are called the blues, which again is a shipping term. Dr. Hugh Cummings is interesting because when I discovered that he was involved in this land ship, I was a little stunned. If you know your history of the West Indies and the Federation, Grantley Adams became the premier of the Federation, the first and only premier of the West Indies Federation. And when he went to Trinidad, Dr. Hugh Cummings became premier of Barbados. So we're really talking of someone very much high in the middle class who was involved in helping to organize a working class community. So what we're seeing in at least in one of the parades, you have 15 land ships. So very, very huge. So what we just showed you, what I showed you, dancing, think of 500 people dancing those steps and listening to the music. In 1930, I love this. I read through the newspapers and suddenly there's a big complaint in the newspaper because apparently the land ships sailed their way up to a very established, what we would call a white Barbadian community or a very elite community plant and merchant class elite community. They're sailing and they're drumming and dancing. And so the community wrote, someone from the community wrote into the newspaper complaining that the noise was so much, they were taking possession of the air for half and three quarters of a mile. Imagine this noise, lots and lots of landship in the middle in a space that you shouldn't be. So that's what I conclude that for, it's beautiful. Now, if you're sailing, it's the imagery of sail that has come through. So the, each land ship has a dock and a dock is the name of their headquarters. It would be a house, it'd be a chattel house, it would be someone's house and that becomes a dock. 
And of course, the land around the ship become the waters because you're sailing. You're not sailing on, you're sailing on land, but actually it becomes the waters. And I honestly, honestly, this is storytelling. I interview a very old land ship man and he said to me, you know what we would do with the fireworks? We have something called bombs. In Barbados, they used to be little fireworks that when you threw them, they go boom. And these big men would lay in wait in their dock. They have invited another ship to come and join them. And as the ship approaches, they'd bomb the ship. And I said, you can't be serious. He says, yes, it was good fun. <laughs> so they would bomb the visiting ship out of the waters, adding pounds of steel. Remember that sound of that tap band? This tap band is known as the engine of the ship. It's the music. And as you want the ship to move, remember this is the time of sail. So it's not the time of, of engine where you just turn on the engine and go. It's the time of steam. It's the time of sail. So that in those days, you would actually add pounds of steam. I'm seeing the time. Yes, this I got from my mom. My mom was born in 1929. And she remembers as a child, land ships would parade and they would carry ropes around them so that they would be physically looking like a ship, though it's a ship of human beings, is what Kamo would call the body voice. So the bodies are moving and rocking and dancing like a ship. I've also shown you already the sailing master, and I'm honestly running out of time. But I want to show you this image. The land ships have a tradition of going to church. This gentleman here is Admiral Watson. This is a gentleman who is now presently ailing. This is a gentleman for whom the ship danced Two, two, on Tuesday, two days ago. This is a lady who was going to play the flute and these are the top band players. This is the gentleman here. He was quartermaster Graves. He's now Captain Graves. And he's the gentleman you saw leading the ship dancing just now. And I'm just gonna give a couple of quotes cause hey, I'm an academic. So Baba talks about the menace of mimicry is its double vision, which discloses the ambivalence of colonial discourse, yes. Even though they were told they were the Navy, the British Navy, I'm finding so many narratives of Africanity within them. And Stuart Hall, again, born in Jamaica, who was the, one of the gurus of cultural studies and one of the philosophers of the 20th to 21st century, he's saying that the pockets of survival in their pure form are massively outweighed in our culture by the way African derived cultural practice and meaning survive by being synthesized. They're synthesized. So even though I'm saying to you, Africa, Africa, you're gonna say, well, Marcia, look, they're dressed in white. They look like a Navy. They look like if they put on ribbons and they're being a Navy. So Hall would say to you, that's creolization. That's the blending of Africa and England. That's the continuing blend. And yet, remember the image I first showed you, the young artist is seeing a spiritual dimension. And that's where I want to end up. So I'm going to fly through this. Yes, everything is synthesized. Everything and they sail. I'm going to the end quickly because I'm at the point. How to navigate or map meanings of sail. Well, in Barbados, they continue to sail. They sail from being shipped largely of men to a ship of girls with some older men. So gender is changing. And perhaps the future of the ship may be female. We don't know. But it is the intangible that is beautiful that we're on trying to understand Barbadian identities quickly, quickly. Identities are the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves. So picking up Amina's conversation, a Nancy, please do not ever drop a Nancy. We have been telling stories of a Nancy for generations after generations after generations. We came, we were brought from the continent of Africa, forced from the continent of Africa, and we brought our memories. We brought our meanings of identity. Let me say it again. Identities are the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves. We in Barbados, we are continuing. I am continuing to try to understand the landship. The young artist, right. So he called his graphic novel and apparently the island of Barbados in his graphic novel was under attack. And so this being coming out of the water has the intention of literally drowning Barbados, killing all the people, attacking Barbados. 
Why do they sail? So in his artist mind, he says, the vessels of the land ship are not real ships, but instead are ancestral ships, joined to the rhythm of each ship's top band and guided by the crew. He says the ships have the ability to fly as they traverse land masses. Some units can also submerge themselves. I thought, wow, that is true. We have inherited the concept of land and in a sense, we weigh them down. The young artist is saying, no, they're ships, they're spirits. Spirits fly, spirits move, ancestral ships can fly. And he came up with this image. Here's the young shipman and the young ship woman, young ship girls. And here they're flying, look, with the birds. Shippings flying through the air, shippings flying through as tanks. This is what he's seen. He's also having someone in the water. And then he deliberately does the young shipman in this kind of, well, for me, reading, as Stuart Hall would say, representation is interpretation. So I'm interpreting his image here, swimming as though he's swimming as though he's saying, come follow me. Notice the birds are in the sky. So he's seeing ships not stuck to land. Let me remind you, his first image that not to be back, Matthew Clark, he's saying the ships as they dance, they are carrying the memories of their ancestors, that their ancestors are dancing with them. As we would say when we look at Juve, as we would say whenever there's a masquerade, we're calling the ancestors with us, ancestors to walk with us. Finally, Vincent Farrell, proclaim my independence. Rest me in the bosom of history when I die. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Burroughs. I just need to acknowledge a couple of comments from someone saying this is a powerful discussion that should continue beyond this forum. We know that. We know that we don't stop, that we are just runners in the long relay until we get to where we want to get to. We want to acknowledge also those persons who are saying can this discussion be available to share with my students about their richer heritage? And also we wish more people would take this festival seriously. We too, but we also know about the power of one. And because our numbers are small, does not mean that we are not impacting, that we are not being effective. I believe Sean is gathering some of the comments that might have come in on his end and his own comments that he wants to make. But gathering from, from, from you, Marcia, that when we look at the, the gender images, the mm -hmm. male and female, man, woman, I get very confused now, images in our folklore, as stories, as songs, as iconic representations, that we are not just learning about masculinities and femininities in terms of how those would express themselves, but we're learning about what was transmitted, how it was transmitted and how it was preserved. Mm -hmm. And so I want to throw at you one of the, one of the concepts that Kamau Brathwaite certainly taught me about masking, about yes. the fact that women were allowed to do certain things because how dangerous can a woman be? So when you talk about the gender shift, that yes. certainly has to be part of it, that men did some things and women did some things equally subversive to the system, which is perhaps why Aunt Nancy is sometimes called Aunt Nancy, because it's just a little spider and is a woman. So why should we? Why no, should we? I, I quite agree. There's something I discovered very early on that I didn't quite understand until later. The women in the land ship were called stars, S-T-A-R-S. -S. So when women were allowed to be in, and it seems to be then, well, as far as we can see from recorded history, I have no idea if they were there before, somewhere around the 1930s, women are in the land ship and they're called stars. That's, I put a point there. Later on, I'm told land ship was involved in Marcus Garvey. Star is a Marcus Garvey term. And George Lamin has a memory of being in Carrington Village in town, seeing a land ship marching, carrying a star before them. He says, yes, I saw these big women marching with a star. So women are called stars. But that point, I can tell you, if the British officials realize 
that land ship was actually up to Marcus Garvey would have shut them down. So, but the best thing that Camo would say, the best way to hide is really out in the open. You put on the uniforms of the master and you march and the master goes, oh, how nice, you know, they're not quite really good enough to be British, but they're entertaining. And all the way they're doing Marcus Garvey. So that when Marcus Garvey came to Barbados in 1937, he went a couple of places in one day. Would you believe the first place he went was to a land ship for one day? Marcus Garvey, Marcus Garvey was so fond of, of, of pageantry. Earlier you mentioned yes. his hat and his feathers yes. and everything yes. that he wore. Um, yes. Almost like a modern day Michael Jackson, representing yes. and symbolizing. Um, yes. Can I just pick up where you spoke about memory just yes. now? Because sometimes we believe that memory is something you have to fall asleep and go into a trance to pull out. Mm -hmm. But in that first um, musical piece, and yes. maybe two questions I want to ask you now. With the men dancing, um, that looks so much like uh, the Jamaican junk on a heel and toe. Yes. And that looks so much like a uh, 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 Ugandan dance called the Cowfoot that yes. our Ugandan storyteller has yes. taught us. Would you like, first of all, to comment on the yes, fact that memory is say... not 10 centuries away? Now that, now that land ships have moved themselves or have sailed away, or maybe the society they've brought the society on, no longer are they just mockery, although there's some individuals in society who think that. But now serious work is being done. Now, I created cultural studies at Cave Hill, and one of the dancers who trained in Jamaica at Edna Manley, he created a land ship technique. He's been documenting the moves and making sure that we've got something written about the ship movements. So definitely, once we take away the cloak, what I call the cloak, I call all of that um, clothing is a cloak, is a mass, it's part of pageantry, you're quite right, I mean, it's part of pageantry. Once we take that away, we see, so what is the memory they have brought forward? Camo says body voice. What have they captured for us? And what continues to be captured kinetically? So for example, yes, we don't know. I've seen documents of enslaved peoples in Barbados dancing and singing and howling. Europeans are writing it. So it's howling, which is great. It means they can't understand what they're singing. We don't know if that has come through and that somewhere along ships, the shipping societies, captured a bit of the movements and the memories of Africa, of African Caribbean peoples. Um, despite the serious, intense Creole um, colonization that happened in Barbados, by cloaking it in, in British uniforms, they were able to keep it. Problem, problem. Back to you. We, Later we generations to... forgot why they're dressed like that. <laughs> so yeah. they say, ah, Barbados is lingling, -ling, look at the land ship. And I go, no, there's so much more. So it's recovering and uncovering those memories. Yeah, we, we, we therefore want to acknowledge Terry and Chisholm who finds this discourse quite elucidating and she's enjoying the reframing of a Nancy. I, I, I want to make a comment on that just before we close the program, but I want to go back to landship because recently, maybe three or four days ago in Barbados, you removed a rather troublesome statue. Am ah. I correct? Yeah, Papa. And the landship people were dancing the statue away. Um, no, that's an interpretation. I'm not sure landship was there at all. As I said, landship is actually trying, they're celebrating the life of their admiral. But yes, it took 207 years for us to get Nelson moved. He went up in 1813, and from the time he went up, they were agitated to move him. 1813, 1819, 2013. A lot of the discussions around Barbados are centering around Black Lives Matter. That, yeah. that movement has such global impetus that that may have encouraged the government of Barbados to finally pick him up. Yeah. What I will say is I didn't expect them to have a whole pageant after. It was, I, so I went to Bridgetown, I saw them cutting him, heard him cutting him away, and I'm laughing and everyone is looking and then we had a big pageant. Um, I'm writing an article on it, so I'll send it to you when I'm finished because yeah. I'm not sure, I'm torn between whether you celebrate or mourn. I like to do a little bit of both because exactly where Nelson is stationed or was stationed, literally 
10 footsteps of where is the careenage. We know African enslaved peoples were brought there. We know they were made to cross over that careenage and possibly were sold right where Nelson is or somewhere near. But Barbados has followed or is now part of, not followed, let me not say that, is part of a worldwide movement of questioning the meaning of statues and taking them down. Coming back to that, Nicole Williams is watching or peeping out from our class. I hope our class is watching with her. <laughs> and she's saying that she's quite loving the discussion. So let me go back to what you just said. If yes. we accept what Nicole said earlier about the folklore being all of these iconic representations that include statues and carvings, mm -hmm. then Nelson became part of our folklore. And his removal is therefore also asking us to examine that which we have come to valorize as part of the folklore and then honestly said to ourselves, what are we going to do with it? Let's say this, Nelson was put up in 1813 and just in slavery. So the enslaved population, which was easily 95% of the island had no say. Um, it's highly possible the free colors didn't have say either because the free colors were discriminated, the enslaved were discriminated, free colors were discriminated. And then I had a small group called the big whites and the small whites, trust me, the small whites when I had a say. So a really small percentage of the population put their money together and put Nelson up. Um, and Gabby praised him in the 70s, came up with the song, Take Down Nelson. Take down Nelson, put up a Bajan man, put up a Bajan man. And it was beautiful to see Gabby there 30 years later said, hey, take down Nelson. I'm sure he might have said, them should have, them finally take down Nelson, take down Nelson. So when, when I think with the Confederate statues, for example, Confederate statues are put up 50 years sometimes after the war, but the persons of African descent had no say in putting the statues up, but were made to say this represents your history. And so the American South said, ah, no. And the same thing with Barbados. Nelson is in Barbados. He actually didn't like us. He thought the planters were arrogant. And to be honest, by putting them up, that he probably rolled over in his grave. But we did put him up. Now that the society, the body voice of the society, 97 plus can say, okay, time to go. We've been trying that for 200 and some years, time to go. At this moment, there's a great debate. What have, what have happened without Black Lives Matter? I don't know. I don't know. It, every time there was a movement to take Nelson down because he doesn't represent the folk, there would be a response of, but he's our history. We can't move our history. That's part of our identity. Da, da, da. Well, he's gone. Doc, Dr. Burroughs, in the 10 minutes or so that we have left, Yes. I, I want to look at practically what we do now. Bec and, and, and then I want to ask Sean to share a story. So I, Sean, I hope that you're there because I want you to share the story. And the story really is about how do we know when it is important to listen? When our grandparents are telling us these things, we think it's old fashioned things, you know, and we don't pay them no mind until after them dead and gone. So in that context, I want to ask Sean to, to, to relate his own experience about how he discovered when it was important to listen. But in the same vein as knowing when it is important to listen, watch Amina, and Marcia, and Nicole, and Opal Palmer Adisa up here, I talk big word thing and big concepts about the people. After we don't say that these things that we cherish come from the people who are on the margins of society. Yes. We yes. up here now are talking language that they must say, I wonder, I wear them up there say. So, so what do we do about that aspect of it so that our children will want to hear it and will not feel that we're speaking in distant things from themselves? And after you have commented on that, Sean, I hope you're there because you share this lovely story about when you learned too late that it was important to have listened to your grandfather. So over to you, Dr. Burroughs, and then, and then, well, I and did. then Sean, um, I, and I, I share what's coming up next, and then we can close off for today. 
okay, what I did in 2015, I brought together a lot of my research and then I did an open call to the nation. And I went to find as many elderly landship people as possible. I am working on a book, but what I did for the public, public acknowledgement was I created an exhibition, an exhibition that was able to tour all of the parishes and all of the libraries. I love what you said about libraries, all of the libraries in Barbados so that the public could come and see. By doing that, by the way, some of the public identified some of the images of the men and women in these photos from the 1970s. So I was able to keep gathering information. That exhibition is now permanently up inside a dock, not a library, not the university, inside the dock. Today, it's called the Barbados Landship. The dock is in a working class village, in Licorice Village, it's called. And anyone who wants to can go to the dock and see all of the work. I'm very much about making knowledge popular, about making knowledge accessible. Yes, the academic wants, and my, man, my, my mandate is to create for academia, i.e. book shelf. I call it the culture of the shelf, but I'm cultural studies. I'm also trying to impact the culture of the everyday, the culture of knowing, the culture of being. And therefore by, share, by giving it that popular form, hopefully, um, for example, I'm looking in the chat, I'm seeing what Damien Har Hed Harridge is saying, and I'm seeing Damien twice posted. Now this is on YouTube, but maybe it'll be out there for anyone doing studying landships to see another interpretation of landships. So making it popular, sharing it around, but please gather your elderly, listen to them, record them, write down their stories. Remember, identity is the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves. A famous Clifford Gates statement, anthropologist Clifford Gates, repeated by Stuart Hall and so many others. Listen to your elderly, they have so much knowledge to share. Some of us can't see what Damien Herridge posted. Oh, I'll say, he, um, he's saying very interesting presentation. Landship is one cultural form being studied in theater arts, CSEC. I do hope my students are tuned in. <laughs> Need the presenters, contact an email, blah, blah. Then he says, my modern day understanding of landship is the come together society that I have grown up to see and learn about as a child. My grandmother and mother are members of the community. They join the society, they pay their dues through, Whenever come one dies, they visit the home, true, and they have a meeting and they celebrate the life. That's what's happened to, well, Cap Admiral is very much alive. No, no, let's not ship him off yet. But they are in the process of doing the rituals of ensuring, just as that young artist said, that the spirits gather to carry, to sail that soul home. Whether he goes home in four years or never, I sincerely hope never. Admiral is a wonderful person. They would march and have land, elements of landship very interesting. The people who join the group are ordinary. Yes, yes, yes. Middle classes don't join landship. I have danced landship officially when the government of Barbados sent us up to Haiti. It was Carrie Festa and the National Cultural Foundation. Many individuals there trained in cultural studies with me. They decided to make the entire production for Barbados a landship production. So I gave a lecture. Um, but all of us learned ship. And let me tell you, see that elderly gentleman who was training individuals? He fagged me out. I couldn't move. And he says, right, well, aren't you ready? Let's go again. I'm like, huh? <laughs> they can dance. You talk about exercise, 79 years old, they can dance. Camel says the body voice, the body carries the memory. So I'm glad, Damien, I sincerely hope. Yes, they have a nurse. Yes, they pay dues. Yes, they wear uniforms. Yes. That, um, there are, I've been hearing of a couple of societies now that we're becoming more integrated as a Caribbean. I think the, the, the shipping narrative of the British uniform may really be a reflection of how colonized Barbados was, or perhaps is. We're very much in the stranglehold of constructs of Britishness. And so even though we are these people of African descent mixed with a number of other peoples as we all are during slavery, because of slavery, we have this label of being British. We've moved Nelson. Um, someone from the government asked me, what would I put in this place? And I said, nothing. I'm trying to understand what is there. Yes. As soon as we put something mm -hmm. else, they go, oh, here we yeah. go now. And a generation later we'll move him because, and on and on. 
I need to understand what is there. That's the work I'm doing now. Their processing what, was done what, in the form what, of a ship. Okay, Damien, is this in Jamaica? The people who joined the group are ordinary people. Damien is sharing with us his memories. They're I wish you the would come on. Yeah, Damien, I wish Jamaica. you would come on and talk to us. Damien. Damien, I wish you would come on and talk to us. I'm not seeing what he's saying. So he's remembering Jamaica. Where in Jamaica was this done, Damien? Because Jamaica big, Barbados small. Oh. Jamaica big. <laughs> Listen, remember I tell you the story how I walk out the back door and hit a mountain? How yes. Barbados would never have a mountain in the back door. Never have a mountain. Good, good, afternoon. good afternoon. Good afternoon. This is Damien. One moment, please. Yes, Damien. this is Damien. Damien. Just, sorry, Damien, let me just call for Sean again, because certainly part of what we're talking about is important work, which the library has to do. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. All right. Go, go ahead, Damien, and then we can share what's coming yeah, up. As, as I shared earlier, um, based, because the students are doing landship, and when I did my presentation the other day, I made reference to this experience. As a child growing up in the community, we had what they call the Come Together Society. And they had several of them. My grandmother was a part of it. And they would have things like rallies where they raised funds. The persons would pay their dues. They have a book, like a bank book, that it mm -hmm. is recorded in. Yeah. They call it turnover, based on my understanding Barbados. They call it dues that are paid. And they would visit the sick or the shutting yeah. or the elderly. So if you're ill, you get a sum of money and they visit you and give you special packages. When the person dies, what happens is they go, they will post their banner, they have a march. And if the person, they would march around the community, mm -hmm. post um, themselves at the yard of the individual for probably an hour or so. And the same playing of the, the, they have a band that they would play. When the body has been taken in the hearse, the hearse is in the middle, the nurses and so on are, are at the side, and the other members, they are all fully dressed in white. That is their ceremonial costume. The nurses have on their hats, mm -hmm. and they, there's a thing called a regalia that the president wears across the, the chest. Yep. And they have um, two swords that they use to point, and everybody has to come through this particular thing during the procession. When the body reaches the funeral, when the body reaches the cemetery, the ritual again is performed where the sword is crossed and placed over the, the grave. Yeah. And then before the body is lowered, all of the nurses or the armor bearers would be the ones who would lead the necessary activities. And the president would do all the necessary that as, in terms of um, a particular ritual and when they're finished, they all turn their backs mm -hmm. when the body goes down. And then if there's a child that is youngest in the family, the ritual of passing yes. the child over yes. three times over yes. the casket in the grave. And this was something that I never really quite understand until I got much older. Because persons who don't understand it when they have their meetings, they would say it's lodge. Yes. And as I would often say to my students, anything people don't understand, they call it all kinds of names. Like Kumina, they call it Obia. Yeah. When, when, well, but in truth and in fact, it's actually a retention. It's a rites of passage. It is true. Right? And it is actually a ritual. Kumina is a ritual. You have to understand yeah. it and so on. It's so the landship, I'm quite familiar with it in the context of the contemporary society in Jamaica. I need to find out for my mother because it has been breaking away because of the tradition Mm -hmm. And people are not keeping the retention, as you said, or holding on to their, their history. It is kind of dying out. So I need to find, because find out from her if this society really still exists. Because trust me, persons used to benefit a lot. They shot in, and it would, it would be a benefit to persons who die. Because, yes. And just yeah, like the land Where is this society? Where is this society? Where did you experience this? Where Actually, you well, I'm from Trelawney. Trelawney. I am from Trelawney in Jamaica. That's uh -huh. where I learned of that. And there's a district known as Granville, okay. which is one of those areas that, this is one of the society, the other one is in Martha Bray, where they have the famous rafting village, Martha Bray River, and the whole story of Martha Bray and that woman and so on. I am from that particular area. 
Okay. So I learned of those um, situations based on what I, I um, remember. And there's a night when they would come, they call it the night, the society's night. So yeah. these persons come and they keep their meeting yes. and only the members were allowed to participate or engage in yeah. the activities on that particular night. Nobody Absolutely. outside of that particular group. Because it's You're a very significant are, ritual me, that is performed allow me during that time. Privileges. They may <laughs> allow me chairman's privilege because That's I do problem. want us to, uh, I don't want us to go without looking at the business of when we realize it is important to listen and here is someone sharing with us that I realized long after my granny was telling stories of her granny who was born in Africa that I should have written them down. The food, the language, the clothes. And then she says, big up Barbados. The place is set. Nelson is where he ought to be. In the museum. Well, I'm not even sure if it's in the museum. But... <laughs> I will roll him into the sea, honestly. But that's just me. Because <laughs> um, so, just like so... you, um, Miss Boris. Yes. I I am thinking of I'm planning on documenting because I want to do a kind of a research. Yes. Based on a lot of the history that were told. Because there are a lot of things that my grandmother told me then that I'm not understanding. And one of the things I said I need to do, I need to go back home, sit down with my mother, pick her brain, do probably a videotaping, a recording speak to the persons who are eldest in the community because I lost out a lot because I had to move away. Mm -hmm. And the fact now that I am so more into Mr. finding Mr. out the Mr. history. Harriet, Mr. Yes? I'm with you. We're going to do a session on oral histories, <laughs> how, we, how we gather them and how we document them because there are so many things that I'm making a note of yes. that's coming out of this. So much of what has been said resembles yes. the Etu in the adjoining parish to yours in Hanover. So, oh. so that's one thing. Yeah. Um, that's so I've cool. made those two, those notes of those two things that we don't have to wait on the festival and worm in Barbados, uh, Rampoon, Library, yeah. Jamaica Library Service. If we <laughs> wait on the festival, we're going to have too much thing to say one time. And there is no reason that we can't have a cultural discourse every moonshine night. We don't know how is often. That true? Is that true? You know? So, so we need to make a plan as to how yeah. we break down the various aspects of the discussions that we need to follow through. I do, however, I insist, I want to hear from Sean Thomas because yeah. Sean Thomas did learn a valuable lesson about how he was right. him grandfather. Sean, right. where are you? <laughs> Greetings, right. everyone. I am Sean Thomas. I'm representing the Jamaica Library Service on this International Men's Day. So. I want to take the time out to big up all the men. It is still International Men's Day and I'm representing for all the men everywhere and particularly in the Jamaica Library Service. So even though this, the face of this presentation, you aren't seeing a lot of males, a lot of them are in the background. So I want to send a shout out to Mr. Laws who, who is assisting technically with, right here. Mr. Laws, Mr. Hall, Mr. Gilman, Mr. Stevens, and Mr. Burke. You know, hear how many misters? So even though you don't see them on screen, they are very much a part of pulling this uh, event together. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Dr. Meeks, for allowing me the opportunity to share my story because it's still a storytelling festival, you know. So my story is essentially, and I will make it a short story, and I will draw on a uh, comment that Dr. Burroughs made earlier okay. in the chat. And specifically, she mentioned the power of the voice. Mm -hmm. So that underscores my story. So when I was young, I used to spend holidays with my grandfather in Kingston, but he's from the country. So when I was in the country, you know, at that time, dopey stories were a thing. Cell phones never come in it, that sort of thing. So there were a lot of dopey stories. And then there was this particular character in the dopey stories that they used to, it, it used to be a mystical and a mythical character. And uh, they, they, this character was Mother Pretty that they say was a witch who used to ride across the river in the night on a three foot horse. 
So I used to get scared and participate as a youngster in these stories. But when I visited my grandfather in Kingston now, my grandfather was one, he was, he was, I would say semi-literate, but on the lower end, all right? So he did, a, he, he did a lot of storytelling. Everything that him said to us, he put it in a story form. So here is what I used to do now as a youngster and not, not applying that, um, that importance to it. I used to, while he was talking, I used to interject with yes and okay and so on and all right. And um, he would think I was actively listening. I was hearing. And then guess another thing is that he was blind. My grandfather was blind. Well, he went blind. I, I, I knew him when his sight was going and then subsequently he went blind. So more, most of what he shared with me was when he was blind. But here's the thing now. I realized that if he was talking and you, and you leave out of the room, even though he can't see him, no. If you're there to him left, him no. If you're there to him right, him no. So you can't trick him. So I used to try a little way, you know, when I was getting distracted, you know, I'm on holidays and watching TV and so on, getting distracted, want to go outside and play and so on. But he wanted to, to share these stories and it, it's now in my adulthood I realized that it was very important. He, he saw it as a very important thing for him to share these stories and for him to have an audience in the family to share it with. So because I couldn't get away from him now, I had to be there. And even though I was trying to evade him by just interjecting, yes and okay and all right, me here, man, and so on, I had to hear because it was the voice. Mm -hmm. So he was saying things that I didn't register immediately. But growing up now, coming into adulthood, I have, have, have to start reflecting on everything. And one of the key things that I found out is that he used to talk about the character that I used to listen to as a child in the dopey stories of them called Mother Pretty. I realized that my grandfather used to say that was his grandmother. Yes, I remember a couple of stories where my grandfather said Mother Pretty was his grandmother. So when I checked it out now, I realized that this great, wonderful dopey story that everybody in the community used to feed off and, and, and connect to other stories connecting to our ancestors. It was directly connected to me. And in addition to that, through his stories, going back to understanding the, the, the understanding gender in Caribbean folklore, in telling his stories, because my grandfather, he never, he never writes, because as I said, he was not really literate. So most of him say him talk. And there is so much I can draw now from what my grandfather said that I was telling Dr. Mix that I could write a book. So you see how significant that is. And within those stories, a lot of other things came out because um, in growing up now and facing reality, taking on certain amount of responsibility as an adult, I realized that, you see, you see this thing that my grandfather did say, it was a serious thing. This other thing when he did say, this is what I understand now. It, it, it applied to financial literacy. This applied to ethics. This applied to morality. This, so that is the nature of the story. So I want to thank the panelists again for that spirited uh, discussion, conversation, and it highlights the significance and the importance of sharing these stories to shed some light and to clarify the narratives so that the appropriate messages can be shared going forward. The appropriate mes messages can be transmitted and received and actioned, and particularly by the men in our society. So as Dr. Meek said, we look forward to continuing these series of events. And uh, afterwards, we will go to, I think, a commercial break. We will, we will highlight some of our sponsors, and then Dr. Meek will take over again. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sean. That was so worth sharing, so valuable. Oh. Thank you. Okay, commercial break, and then we come back to more. <laughs> the commercial break done? The commercial break done? <laughs> we wouldn't okay. make a penny. 
So right. we, highlight, we highlight in the minister, the Ministry of Culture, Gender, Entertainment, and Sport, we're highlighting Entukuma Foundation and the NCB Foundation, as well as the Jamaica Library Service. Of course. Um, not, not on this board is Mossam. Mossam is definitely one of the sponsors participating in the book launch. Tomorrow morning, I launch in my children's book. That's a good idea. And we want to big up Mossam um, for assisting us with that. Um, the Rita Marley Foundation, who has given us permission to use her very important song about pulling together, the song called Harambe. We want to big up Rampoon Radio. We want to big up Ann Worm from Grenada, the spicy lady from the Spice Island. And of course, all our hardworking team um, who know where they are. Big up everybody from across the world who has participated in this and all the people who are giving us the encouragement that these discussions help to break the silence of many of the misconstrued ideas we've had about our African heritage. Certainly on this program, Dr. Burroughs, Professor Opal Palmer Adisa, and Nicole Williams, we have learned to broaden our understanding of what we mean by oral tradition. We talk some of it, we look on some of it, we dance some of it, we sing some of it, and very importantly for me in terms of the similarities that were highlighted in the discussion between yourself, uh, Dr. Burroughs and, and Damien Heritage is that we have what we need to pull ourselves together in this region. Who we are, what we are about and our resources cannot be defined by the borders of the waters that wash our shores. Yeah. So we look forward Stay to continuing the discussions. Thank you all very much. Please come back tomorrow morning at 10 for the book launch. We have invited all the students across the region to join us at 1230 for our celebration of National Storytelling Day. You are going to see some awesome performances from some little ones to some big ones. So we're very happy about that. And then on Saturday, we have our Anansi rerun where we're going to be looking at some of the highlights of this week, but also some of the important markers and milestones that brought us here. Dr. Marcia Boros, tell all your friend them say, on Sunday we have a court case because people have charged Anansi with some serious thing. Oh! She is going to, court <laughs> to demand reparation because people oh. think say, we only want money out of reparation, but we want back with this, and we want back with that, and we want back with everything where we used to got, including our good name. So thank you all very much. And um, we promise to pull out what needs to be done and work with the library to see what is the best way to follow it through. We now know that we don't have to be in the same location for a follow through. And so this, this technology will become very important. Thanks, everybody. Walk good. Bye. Bye. Walk good. Walk good. I'm good to walk with you. Come, Miss Clear, take the back of your head, my dear. Come this way, Miss Flo. Evening breeze up blow. Help down ya, after you not be subverted by. Rest yourself at ease, feel the evening breeze. Evening time. Work is over now, it's evening time. With the walk on mountain, the walk on mountain, the walk on mountain side. Make we cook the big up on the way. Make we eat and sing, dance and play, ring ding on the mountain side. 
ketchup di bayam mata, pas me de gongo bees, rub up the floor as sierra, la vilina. Time work is over now. It's evening time. With the walk on mountain, the walk on mountain, the walk on mountain side. Make we put the little funny way. Make we eat and sing, dance and play, ring ding on the mountain side. Come, Master, take the pack off your head, my son. This way, Master Joe. Evening breeze up low. Help down ya after you know be so burdened, sir. Rest yourself at ease. Feel the evening breeze. Evening time. Work is over now. It's evening time. With the walk on mountain, the walk on mountain, the walk on mountain side. Make me cook the big up on the way. Make we eat and sing, dance and play, ring ding on the mountain side. Catch up the fire, mata. Pass me the gold piece. Rub up the floor, I see around. Glad feel evening.